again, here we are for another, what I am anticipating quite confidently is going to be a brilliant conversation with Dance Mama and Sharon Watson, absolute icon of the British dance scene and beyond. <laughs> Hopefully this makes you blush, it should. It it should well. <laughs> Sharon is multi-award winning just trailblazer basically. She has rewards across arts, culture um, and business and she's currently in her uh, relatively new position as CEO and Principal of Northern School of Contemporary Dance up in Leeds in the UK. Um, this for some of us who are very au fait in the dance world is following her long-standing position as Artistic Director of Phoenix Dance Theatre where she actually started with the company as one of the first female dancers in 1989. Back then it was an all-male dance company. So just through her entire career, it is just trailblazing after trailblazing, which is fantastic, including having her own company, ABCD. Recently, she has two uh, works that have been super resonant uh, culturally and politically, uh, 2018's Windrush Movement of People and more recently Black Waters, which was due to tour this year, but because of darn COVID, um, I'm sure she would tell us a little bit where, where that might be at. Um, and that piece is exploring the colonial commodification of people in the 18th and 19th century, I believe, and do correct me if I get this wrong, um, of people in Africa and India. And it's a collaborative fusion of contemporary dance and katak with rhythm mosaic. But we are here to talk about how on earth <laughs> Sharon <laughs> has do, done all of this and been a mum. <laughs> Sure, oh, thank you. That's that's quite an, a, an introduction, Lucy. Um, I sometimes reflect on when I hear that, and I just think, yeah, that's that's um, the journey was so exciting, and it is exciting. And I think that's you know keeping that going is just the thing that you know is is like fuel, really. But yeah, it's um, keeping going and being a mom. That's quite another another side of of the world that is, is real and exists. So. And yeah. lucky students at Northern to have you. I mean, it's it's just extraordinary and just inspiring uh, and, and the up and coming generation of dancers and generations to, to come in, in that slightly different way. Although I know absolutely you've been into vocational centers and beyond teaching and lecturing before, but the, you know, they are gonna be having, I undoubtedly an extraordinary time with you so how, how exciting to be speaking to you at this moment despite all of the the yeah. obvious doom and gloom um i think it's important to kind of hold on and really celebrate the the joyful things that we've actually we've got as well to kind of balance a bit of that out we need to understand how much we need them now yeah the the, the, the sh it's shifted in terms of the importance of their contribution and their ability to understand the skills that they offer not just us as a as an education centre in terms of the work we do, but the, the world, the universe needs them and it needs them to understand where their role becomes integral to helping us grow, to change our thinking. So, and the confidence, and I, you know, we often talk about confidence in a lot of things that we do, but actually we need to build the confidence. We can't just tell them to be confident. We have to show them how to do that and demonstrate when it's actually happening. So it's quite an amazing, it's, it's a, a very interesting time for them to have ownership of this situation. Brilliant. Just, well, uh, can I rewind back about 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> so, down to the kind of family context, tell us a bit about kind of what your family setup is. Ooh. Well, I am married and I have two children. Um, I say children, I have a 20 year old daughter and an 18 year old son. And uh, we, my daughter actually at the moment is in Coventry and my son is doing his A-levels. My hubby has a business that, that operates from home, which is fantastic right now. And um, I'm one of eight children. So wow. I'm from a, a very big family. I'm number seven, which is always an interesting place when you think about the hierarchy of, of children and siblings. So yeah, I'm, I'm number seven in my family. Um, and my mum is still with us. She's elderly right now and 
protected from COVID. My father passed quite a few years now, 10 years ago. So I, you know, I have a, a strong family network um, and I use them well. <laughs> always good to hear fantastic so in terms of kind of the context of your work environment probably well absolutely now because once you're a parent you're always a parent oh. is how I perceive things but um we'll, and we'll explore a little bit more perhaps when they arrived on the scene but um how is your parenting acknowledged in in your current work context <laughs> That's an interesting one because it's quite, it is really quite interesting. I feel like I'm a parent to 250 young people right now. <laughs> and um, um, I was actually lecturing here at the school when I, was, when I had my first daughter, um, my first child, which was quite an interesting way of operating when you're doing a physical exercise and you're carrying a child. Um, so it was, you know, the examples that you have around you becomes really important. Um, my second child, I was with a different company, different environment, but a really interesting um, set of examples there as well. I mean, you know, gone are the days where you could bring your children into work quite freely. There were kids around, but that's what I grew up with. That's what I understood in the studio that, you know, to have a child in, in the room was not an issue. I took my kids on tour with me. I took them, travelled around, <laughs> around the country. Um, just trying to balance the work-life scenario but again that wasn't really it wasn't deemed inappropriate it wasn't deemed um, the wrong thing to do because actually everyone chipped in and it was an amazing I mean they grew up in an environment where my children were able to really feel the environment that they were in but I also felt very safe it was the thing that I think was probably not something that a lot of people would do now is, is bring their kids on the road with them but that's what I felt I was I needed to do in order for me to remain active the roles i were playing at the time were really important to step away from those i kind of needed to find a, a sensible balance and dare i say it that was it that, that's amazing because i think there are some companies that um hoffa Schecter, for example i know does have policies written in about um, bringing children on, on tour um but but you're right i think it's still for a lot of companies and i know that the work that parents in performing arts uh, campaign as an ambassador uh, for them that they're doing is obviously trying to to change those systemic things to make it more possible whereas you may ha then have companies uh, like the Gulbunkian in, in Portugal which has a nursery on site but then most of their performances usually <laughs> are, are in situ and, and, that, and that's a, a bit easier but that is r really brilliant to hear that that was made possible for you and I think absolutely demonstrates that um, there are those examples um, that other companies um, should feel br brave enough and empower their dancers uh, to follow because I think being a dancer it's so part of your identity and particularly as you say the roles that you were performing have um, an importance not just for you as an artist but the impact beyond that artistically culturally is is really important and um, it's just brilliant to hear that you had you had that network to, to support you and the possibility of, of doing both which I feel a lot of people and obviously now it, things are quite different can either feel disheartened that, that the network isn't there or that they the um, amplification of those um, examples isn't there for them to even realize that it is possible so I'm re we all really appreciate you, sh you sharing your experience is it demonstrates that it's it's it it's a lot about the culture it's a lot about the culture of an organization and i think sometimes the bravery if we talk about being brave now i think back in the day being brave to say that actually i'm capable of doing both um and perhaps that's the test that the individual allows themselves to have that to be vocal about what they can and can't do so you know in a way i think if the organization enables one, the open conversation, and two, the ability to make that happen. You get the best of you get the best of both. So it's it's an interesting way of thinking about your the way in which you work and the place in which you work. And dance is always a challenging one because, of course, the physicality is important, but that what can happen within that space um, and the values that you bring within your organisation becomes important. Absolutely. Do Do you think working in the arts made you think differently? about your pregnancy and recoveries? 
I think working in the art, what it did, what it did for me was I, the commitment and the drive that working in the arts sort of embeds within you can sometimes almost push you to the to the other extreme where you become obsessed with making sure that everything is taken care of and nothing is left undone. And that obsession for perfection is 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 kind of needs to be measured. Um, and initially, I think what I felt was that I, I had to make sure that I was well, there's only so many hours in the day and much as I was working from 10 in nine, 10 in the morning till six at night that I'd nip across the road, pick up the child from childcare, get home, and you start another day's work of kind of managing. Actually, that was also not a reality. It didn't have to be that way, but the fear of not knowing at that point and actually being able to have that conversation, once you've had it, you think, ah, oh, yeah, of course, you know, you're only human and this can, this can be shifted. You understand, and especially if someone is a parent, male or female, they understand the complexities around managing a, a young child. So it's really that bravery of, of, of conversation is really a good thing just to say, okay, I'm going to put it on the table and then I'm going to, I'm going to be able to talk about it. But yeah, there is something about the generosity of, of the environment that we're in, understanding the humanity of, the, of what we do. So it has probably helped to some degree to take the edge of some of those challenging conversations. And I think also that kind of ties in what, what you were saying or, or identifying at the beginning of instilling that confidence in, you know, the generation to come, not only for them to speak up for themselves in an artistic scenario or creatively, but absolutely in terms of those logistics that if they choose uh, parenthood and some people don't, um, how to navigate those conversations with, with that confidence and empowerment, which is just vital. How did you approach your recovery postnatally, being a physical performer at that time? Do you know, it's it's taking thinking back to what actually took place is really quite hard to work, to remember. It kind of you know, I'm not saying it happened overnight. It definitely didn't happen overnight. I think the the fact that the body was was prepared to a, to a degree. I taught right up until the, the week before I was due to deliver, which was which was an interesting uh, place to be seated to be to be kind of delivering at that point. But it really did sharpen my skills. <laughs> the alertness and the awareness of your body whilst you're doing that was was really quite amazing. Um, returning to work, I think I came back to work three months after, and I was. I was able to really pace myself. I was going into the studio teaching, not performing. So there was a difference in terms of the level and the height and ability to be able to deliver. Um, and to be able to then also take time for myself just to understand what is going on with my body. Um, yeah. that, was, that was a real pleasure just to think, to figure out actually how I bring myself back together and how much where, if anything, um, the shift in mainly the mental shift I think, because that does tend to take you into a very different place with regards to the kind of personal confidence. So I was able to look after myself with a different form of exercise in terms of Pilates and walking and that kind of thing. And, and just making sure that the body can, is realigned. So having the help from the kind of osteotype work and making sure that, the, you know, you look at it um, what's anatomically um, and bringing things back into place. So that it felt like it was a steady progress. It felt like it happened relatively quickly, but it felt like I was supported along the way with the support that I feel was available to me. Brilliant. And, and again, I think um, it's, it's so important for us to really understand the good practices that go on in organisations to try and extrapolate as much as we can across into the freelance sector where yeah. that support isn't necessarily there in the same way or there might be financial barriers to support or lack of understanding with kind of um, general um, healthcare practitioners um, which is something that Dance Mama hopes to be part of the, the change in making that better and certainly uh, this year I've uh, become part of the Active Pregnancy Foundation um, which uh, seeks with the general populace to kind of advocate for active activity pre and postnatally and has just recently had some CMO approved um, guidelines for that but again they're very generalistic and for the uh, dance population and I think regardless of whether you're performing or not if you're still physically reliant you need that specialist support so that's something that um, we're, we're working on <laughs> to that's it improve and we do have um you know we talk about about the things that are in place and policies 
but actually the policies are useless if they don't become action and you know we talk today we're very we're much more open about the different types of, of uh, maternity needs and, and cover so we have people that are on adoption leave we have people that are um, and all of the different various forms of what's needed in order to, to look after a family and it you have to kind of consider if your policies are not encouraging um, then what is it that you're actually saying about about society about parenting really um, so it's it's quite an interesting one to, and that's great that that's happening because the conversations have happened behind closed doors before now and I'm, I'm glad that they're actually bringing themselves to the fore in terms of open dialogue. Yeah, and I, and I think it's usually that misconception that it's not safe. But if you have a normal pregnancy, normal, <laughs> um, whatever that means, um, but, you know, that it's OK. But I, I felt I ne never before in kind of the NHS that I've been asked to rely on my own intuition before. And it felt like that was kind of what I was taught uh, training, <laughs> but it felt very strange to be coming from healthcare pra practitioners. And I think, although I like that approach, I kind of still want have that hunger, at, which is still uh, again something to be to fig be figured out of having that scientific um, knowledge um, backing it up. Which fortunately, the Active Pregnancy Foundation has amazing scientific advisory boards and is co-founded by. A, um, a professor and a, a research department of um, University of Canterbury, uh, Christchurch, Canterbury. Sorry. So that I, I think there are kind of moves in the right right direction um, that hopefully we can all and future parents, as you say, men and women, because sleep deprivation affects <laughs> both parents. <laughs> uh, how that can be be supported. I think there's some fascinating studies to be coming forth with that. Um, in terms of, um, I suppose, the, the kind of being an inspiration to others, and like you say, having um, those role models around you, do you, do you feel that directly you will have had influence on members of your team, either at Phoenix or at NSCD because of your parenting? Undoubtedly, absolutely undoubtedly. I remember my previous director, artistic director, Darshan Singhula, coming into the studio with his daughter, um, draped over his arm and choreographing. And it was, the, it was just one of the most beautiful things that you could have observed. There was a, a young child that was just so happily, uh, in, in, in their place, needed to be there, his daughter. And the rest of the work continued and he was comfortable. He was, he was happy to know that he's got that relationship and his job isn't being compromised in any shape or form. And when you have an environment like that and you can see it, you understand where you fit into the bigger picture. So I, I was teaching and bringing myself into work, um, you know, fully pregnant. I, I have other teachers that come in pregnant. So it's not, it's not an environment where you can't operate. And that's the thing, when you see it happening, it's like, okay, it is a safe environment, it can happen. And it's, you know, you don't have to be shut away, sat down on, in, on, on a chair and in this situation, talking behind a screen. You can absolutely continue to be physical safely. Um, and the dem and have those, having those examples, having the young people, having pregnant people in your environment, it's not, nothing new, but it's just, it's not taboo either. So let's, let's kind of embrace that and, and make our environments uh, supportive for that. People that are at work and actually and breastfeed in those environments, again, it's not anything that we should be frowning at. So let's get used to it. Let's not try and hide it in a corner and let's make sure that the two things in terms of the person, the child and the environment actually understands what that relationship is. Amazing. I absolutely could not have put that better myself. Absolutely. So it's the normalising, it's having the visibility um, because, you know, 50% of the population of women <laughs> and also in dance about 80% of the industry um, are, are women and, and I guess with my experience that's why I found it is quite bizarre that the only thing albeit brilliant that I that was around at the time in terms of sector support was the One Dance UK fact sheet I was like sure surely, <laughs> surely <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a bit more than that I think also there's always and again, I don't know how qualified that this is. I think some, in some respects, yes. 
But in terms of being a female choreographer, and there's obviously the ongoing debate about, you know, the lack of female choreographers versus male, and is this down to motherhood and stuff? I feel you absolutely just smash that kind of argument to pieces, really. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie to you. There was a moment in my in my career, in my yeah, in my career where I thought I'm never gonna have children. And I, in the back of my mind, it was because actually if I break my, my career now, there is that question of whether I'd ever come back to it. Whatever that was at that moment in time, I'm just thinking I would be considered a, a relatively old mother at the time of, of, of kind of having my first child. That's statistically, um, which is not really the case. I mean, you know, <laughs> it was a healthy age for me to have my children. And I think it's interesting that somewhere in, your, in my psychic, there was that, that niggling question. And actually having had those influences and having had the experience of seeing others go back into the workplace and deliver a phenomenal uh, part two to their career, you just think, damn, this is possible. This can happen. Granted, when I had my kids, I'd stopped performing by then, which I was quite happy to do, but I was able to stay in the industry that enabled me to grow into my next role. So I think there is that preconceived idea that actually, if you really want to succeed, that you can't have a break and have, a, have your children, that you wouldn't get back to it. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's a myth. And then we don't have those stories out in, in the wider sector enough to encourage people to think differently about that. I think that's still lagging behind, um, you know, some of the new trends of, of kind of operations. It's possible. It really is possible. I think also as well, also well, again, I keep sort of circling back to the, the confidence issue, really. But I think there's a certain level of bravery that you have to have to follow the path of dance anyway. It's full of uncertainty and as much as it is in terms of reward and joy. And I feel it's that next level up, isn't it, of if I'm taking some time out that I will be able to, to, to get back in and and. I can't really necessarily put my finger on what fuels that fear other than sometimes the over labored narrative of a linear pathway in terms of career. And I think thankfully over the last 10 years, particularly through things like the, the CAT scheme, which obviously Northern School of Contemporary Dance is part of and that I worked on myself, is we try to get young people to think about having a portfolio career rather than you know train perform choreograph rehearsal direct the end <laughs> um which is just rubbish really um and 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 really unhelpful and um i i, I really hope by sort of amplifying your your story we can really sh shine a light on, on that that um you can get back in and it is possible. And also I'm sure you probably feel, and let, let's find out, <laughs> do you feel your parenting has enriched your uh, choreographic thinking and artistic process in any way? I think I, I, I love the fact that actually when I, when I got an idea, I can bring it to my kids and I, I brought it to my kids at different stages of my development. And I can talk to them about a concept and they can give me a perspective. And what's easy is, and also what's really, really, really sneaky and really lovely that I think it's something that only my kids and I know about, but I will ask them for a move that I can, I can put into my work. And so I'll take something, they've, they've been brought up to dance, to play sport, to do all of the things creative. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like, oh, they didn't choose dance. Okay, but there you go. Um, they so I, I kind of taken little elements and actually that's a really interesting conversation to have with with at different stages of my career where i'm talking to my young my, my younger children about you know an idea and a concept where i'm actually devising and i'm creating and and you know i my when i started to to develop windrush it was the most fascinating conversation with my at the time my 18 year old daughter um and 16 year old son because it meant that there was a, a real purpose, more so than just kind of thinking about a, a concept, but they understood what that narrative was about for them historically and where they felt that actually they could see the bigger picture and understand how, how they came to be in, which none of my other works have absolutely referenced that. So that was quite amazing. And the fact that I had a pregnant, a pregnant woman in the show, um, which was representing my, my mother and their auntie, they were carrying, the, the, one of their 
in fact, it was, yeah, it was her auntie that she was carrying at the time. It just seemed to be a real lived experience for us all. So that, that kind of cemented us. I mean, of course, as young adults now, they're off doing their own thing, but we have that bonding together and just really playing that through a different lens, a younger lens in my work has really been helpful. Wow, that's, that's just amazing. And I absolutely love that kind of celebration of the pregnant dancer on stage. And for me, I've only I've been knocking about a bit and I've only seen that a, a few times and less so in um, kind of abstract work. Um, only a couple of times then have I see, seen a pregnant dancer on stage, Sonia Pedo and Richard Alston, for example, and then more recently Lucy Balfour uh, in Romber a, a few years ago. Um, but the kind of narr narrative element to that as well, it's just, wow, what a beautiful um, connection to have. And, and again, at a time where I guess hopefully we're com coming out of it now, but where we really feel we have to, well, I suppose we always feel we have to exert the value of dance uh, and culture. Um, it, it's really important to, to see, as you say, that bigger picture and those connections, and those ram ramifications um, for those people who might not be as exposed or understand the, the art form. I think, yeah, it's, it's just the, the work that you do is just hugely important and we're all super grateful for it. I'm so glad to hear it reflected that way because you, you do it in the hope that people just appreciate and find their way through it. But I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm realising that there are so many layers and so many possibilities from observing a, a process and, and obviously a result of a, a particular activity. What I think is interesting now is that there is space to be able to have your children and get back on stage. And that can happen at so many, you know, we are accepting that there is an older generation of performers and how wonderful that is, as well as the younger kids that we work with and we work intensely with in terms of helping them to build a career in the profession. But the fact that actually we're, we're, probably, we're looking and embracing the older generation in terms of their, their possibilities just means that actually you can have a sustainable career, which is not necessarily always on stage, but you can go back to that because that mentally, physically, emotionally, we're beginning to understand the possibilities of what an older performer, performer can bring to the to the stage can bring to the to uh, you know the understanding of what content well not even just contemporary dance but dancing itself can offer. And it, it also, I think again, it's another demonstration of the inclusivity that mm. parenthood is is another frontier of of that, and it's just a, a fabulous demonstration of of you know the kind of multicultural kind of melting pot uh, that happens in your work through from your per perspective um, and it, it's demonstrating that visually as well as brilliantly articulately in in this conversation I guess your, your real powerhouse <laughs> of a powerhouse what, what keeps you motivated to keep just cracking on with things and dovetailing um, such hugely impactful work and and motherhood i love people's curiosity <laughs> i really do. i i, I am, i'm inspired i keep saying that you know other people's curtain calls and i use that metaphorically um is part of my 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 curtain call is part of my success as well so i mean to, to just kind of prize that open a little bit i it is that curtain call of someone's, and I say curiosity because they can bring that conversation to the table. And it could have, you know, it could be a matter of months, weeks, years, where you see that come into some kind of fruition and you think, there we go, we started there and we've ended there. That's amazing. So yeah, we've taken that curtain call and that is so satisfying. And I, I sometimes feel that the default position for, for people just because it's so easy to say no. And actually my default position is, well, let's give it a go, let's see what happens. Um, if it doesn't work, you know that you know we've got another avenue. But ultimately, the default position isn't really no, um, and that doesn't. That's probably where I feel that I can be. I, I diverse myself. I diversify my thinking, my working, the spheres of work that I work in. So you know, going from performers, professional, high-end performers, to actually working with with the community on on bikes in terms of choreographing a, a piece of public artwork in terms of cycling. I'm thinking. Yeah, that, that's a nice challenge for me, keeping my, my thinking fresh, but what a beautiful piece of work that the community of cyclists have, have given us. 
So you just really sort of understand. I think I understand the power of my, of my art form. And for me, that does enable me to tell everyone that there isn't one way to do things. Just f fantastic. And that piece of work, it's Ghost Peloton, is that right? It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. Just, again, the power of dance just never ceases to amaze, does it? It really just can permeate everything and, and transcend um, people to just really getting a, a different perspective and and just improvement on, on their on their life and having I think we're all miss, really missing seeing the live stuff so it's brilliant to hear that you've been able to to keep that going with the students at Northern in in this period and again so there you know the parenting comes into play they're not just you as a loco in parentis for them or they're probably all at home <laughs> or some of them but also kind of having that link with their parents and their family being able to see their curtain call of you know how they may have started their dance journey and in, in a lot of cases at a very early stage not all cases but a lot uh, to this point is fantastic. It's, it's I imagine a lot of the parents are quite nervous right now about the, the investment. They're probably quite nervous about the industry, nervous about their, their young person actually really having a, a career that's, that they aspire to, to do. And, and I, it's that, that conversation that you say, that aspiration can't go away. That aspiration, the world is going to need you as people. It's going to need your creativity. It's going to need your thinking. It's going to need your tenacity. All of the things that I think has kept us going over COVID, when you put that into a physical activity, in whether that's in a proscenium arch, whether that is in the park, whether that is anywhere that actually you can, you can be physically engaged, it's going to have an impact. It's the thing that has kept us going, and I do genuinely believe it will be the thing that keeps us going. So for the young person to be able to have done that performance, and it was only last night, and I sat in the theatre um, on the balcony watching and just feeling so satisfied and knowing, you know, these were second years. It's like, yes, we're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to do this together. And actually, you don't understand the power yet of what you have. So let's really kind of spend the next year together figuring out exactly how you're going to strengthen what you already have. So it's, it's you know, and for the parents to understand that as well, they have to come on the journey with us. Otherwise, that fear doesn't, doesn't penetrate beyond the news in, sen in, in the sense that things are just shutting down and disappearing. Well, these are your, these are your startups. These are your new kind of innovative thinkers. These are your new conduits. These are your new health workers. These are your new physical uh, dynamic writers. These are all, all of these things. So yeah, they excite me. It really does. And I think absolutely, so just sort of encapsulating that is kind of, trying to remain hopeful of the absolute explosion <laughs> of creativity that is going to happen when things uh, become more safe and fingers crossed with the the news yesterday um, of a vaccine being approved we're not by no means out of the woods yet but there feels like there's a a, a definite path um, yeah. to do that that we can really kind of hang on to now which is which is fantastic so a last question I'm going to kind of um, pose is what do you feel particularly for parents working in dance? What do you feel is missing and what would you really like to see in the future? I think there is, I can't say for sure. Um, and I can't say because I've not got the evidence in front of me, but I think there's some probably something to understand about the balance of, of the whole thing around parents, dance and finance. I yeah. don't know, I just think, I, I, I'm a bit perplexed as to kind of how it hasn't really sort of become a mainstream conversation um, in terms of understanding really what the financial impact is on parents and, um, and that's parents, both the, the, the mother and the father, um, or, or same sex, or just understanding the whole concept of that because it seems to be one of the areas where I, I mean, money is a conversation for everyone. I'm not going to deny that, but I do feel around this particular area that actually it doesn't seem to have a platform. And so for me, that would be something I would like to see how policies and financial uh, impact of, 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 of kind of decisions would be, would be better served for the big, for the greater good. So that's something I think, and I, it doesn't always sit also in some of the additional policies. So the wellbeing policies as well, where, you know, pregnancies can be supported through, um, 
through different services that are not costing people an arm and a leg and that kind of thing embedded within our thinking in the dance industry so we know one dance uk has a particular take on it the dancer career development could be another maybe there's a joint up kind of opportunity to have this as one so we understand exactly how we support those that are in that particular area that is just fantastic and you're you're absolutely right i mean we we sort of identified it in your experience and in experiences particularly you know kind of raw ballet where they've got a health suite and everything there in a big cast and they're able to to manage um parenthood and particularly maternity leave much more effectively those who are freelance is significantly harder the salary is lower often particularly from from the dance side of things if they've got multi-stranded income uh, and as we we've said you know in terms of them finding osteopathic care or any other th therapist care that they need to re-enter or support them back into the workplace is a challenge as well as as child care too i mean i think the statistic is 76 percent of um people parents working it across dance theatre and music from the Birkbeck survey from a Pippa campaign have had to turn down work opportunities because because of childcare. and I think absolutely you're right that that financial s aspect of it and particularly now really squeezes people out of the industry and forces them to have to look at another income route and we, we are I know it sounds dramatic but we're hemorrhaging talent yeah. uh, but it's getting lost, um, and, uh, you know, and across all uh, types of dancers, but particularly I feel those with um, caring responsibilities, and that may not be children, that could be elder family members, um, it, it's really tough and um, it's really heartening to hear that that specifically is a conversation that we can definitely amplify in 2021. And I hope you're back for that. <laughs> I, absolutely. I, and yeah, I mean, you could be paying for a, a childcare and a mortgage and your childcare is more than your mortgage. You think, wow. Um, so, you know, there are things that I think we can do. And the, the freelance industry is an interesting space for people. I mean, we need them. And if we haven't acknowledged that now under this particular situation that we're dealing with with the pandemic, my goodness, I don't know if there's another time for us to really understand the value of our freelancers and actually, how do we support them better? And that's not just about keeping them in work, that's about their life. You know, we, we understand that you can't separate one from the other. So let's not try and, and we kind of think that we can deploy one part and not take from the other. It's about the whole person. That's the strength of the person that you actually bring into your space. So how do we support that? And I think the different systems and mechanisms out there perhaps also, again, I know that within theatre, um, you know, there's a WhatsApp group of nearly 500 people in theatre. It's like, okay, so where is that WhatsApp group for dance? Yeah. Have we got that? Have we got the conversations taking place about, you know, the pay scales and levels? But just in terms of people talking so that we have some gravitas when we do go and talk to those that um, have the power around the industry and the, and the wealth and the depth of the knowledge, but really the power of the gravitas that we, we contain within our knowledge base, it's just, it's a little bit, it's a little bit thin on the ground. So I think we've still got some work to do, which is unfortunate, but there are some great examples out there for us to pull together and to pull on. So we don't have to do it on our own. Well, I feel like I've had my directive. <laughs> 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 Sharon, just to, just you know i can't express enough how much the industry we just so value you and your work so greatly you are an absolute i said at the beginning icon i didn't i don't say these things lightly i know sometimes my enthusiasm can can bound across but i'm i absolutely mean it because having somebody of your stature with your career and particularly the mix of roles in your career and being a mother is just so important and um just keep doing what you're doing because we love it <laughs> and, and thank you it's it's oh, a pleasure absolute pleasure and um love to all the students and um, one yeah, more stop. Pass that around. <laughs> yeah. thank you and thank you. Here's to a brighter 2021. Thank you, Sharon. And to you too. All the best.